Matthew 1.16. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Christ or the Messiah. What do, you, what do you notice about that verse? What does it not say compared to all the other men that, gave, that, that provided their genes to, to create their sons in the first half of the chapter of, of Matthew? What does it not say about Joseph? He didn't beget Jesus. Jesus was not Joseph's son. What does it say about Joseph as opposed to all the other men in that lineage? It says he is who? He's the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born. Isn't that an interesting thing? Isn't that interesting? Because Matthew right here says that Joseph was Jesus' father, but he didn't provide his genes in the normal way to bring Jesus about. He was just Mary's husband. And let me tell you something. We looked at this a little bit last week with, with, uh, with Mary. This sets Jesus apart from everything else in the world. No matter what anyone says or claims about God, Muhammad, Muhammad, Buddha, any cult leader, any other pastor, any other whoever that says, I know something about God. This sets Jesus apart from everyone else in history. You want to know the reason you can trust Jesus with your soul? Because he is virgin born. If you can claim to be virgin born, it's one thing. If you can actually prove that you're virgin born, it's another thing. And Jesus, through his lineage, through the way he lived his life, proves to us that if God were to come in the flesh, he would look exactly like Christ. He would look exactly like Jesus. So I want you to see, even from Jesus' own lineage, Joseph was not considered Jesus' actual physical father. He was just considered the husband of Mary who raised Jesus. Verse 17 So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and then from David to the deportation to Babylon, so he's uh, recounting history where the Babylonians came down into Israel, snatched up the majority of the people, and brought them back to Babylon. From David to the deportation to Babylon were 14 generations, and from the deportation uh, to Babylon to the Christ was 14 generations. Verse 18, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way, When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name. Anybody that was awake last week? Yeshua. Yeshua. So watch. If your mind, I'm ready to blow your mind if you weren't here last week. Oh, see? So get ready. Ready? Jesus' name was not Jesus at his birth. Oh. Yes. Ready? So then why do we call him Jesus? Great question. So we looked at this very briefly last week, but I'm going to bring you all up to speed. Ready? Jesus is not a Hebrew name. Jesus is an English name. Okay? So watch how this works. When, when the angel speaks to Joseph and spoke to Mary last week, he says, you shall call his name Yehoshua, which means God is my salvation or salvation is from the Lord. If you were to transliterate that, it goes from Yehoshua or Joshua which is, a, which is a Hebrew name, to Aesus, which is Greek, which is what the New Testament was written in, to Latin, and then it finally makes its way all the way to Jesus in English. So in your Bible, Jesus is still referring to the same guy, and that is his name. But I want you to realize that when, he first is, when the angel speaks these words, he's giving Jesus a Hebrew name, not an English, Latin, or Greek name. He's giving him the name Yehoshua, which really Jesus' name was Joshua, but it just, it's transliterated down to Jesus in our, in our Bible. Did I blow your minds? Did I just wreck your Christmas? Everybody, everybody okay? Still with me? All right, here we go. It's going to get better. Here we go. Hang on. You shall give him the name Jesus or Yehoshua, for he will save his people from their sins. Underline verse 21. 
You want to know why Jesus came? He did not come to give you a better life. He did not come to make your life more happy. He did not come to save your marriage. He did not come to make your kids obedient, which is almost impossible. He did not come to do anything. Those are all secondarily great things. Those are all peripheral things. But the main thing Jesus came to do was to save you from your sin. He came, watch, he came to save you from something you cannot save yourself from. He came to save you from something you cannot transform in your own life. Verse 21 is Jesus' calling card. Why are you here, Jesus? Boom, shaka. Matthew 1, 21. Here's why I'm here. Why are you here, Jesus? You here to give everybody a happy life? Nope. I'm here to save people from their sins. I hope their lives are happy because their, their, their lives are changed by me. But my primary goal is to save people from their sins. Because guess what? This life doesn't last forever. But once you die, that life does go on forever. So during this life, we figure out if our sins are saved, if we're saved from our sins. Let me illustrate it to you like this. Matthew one twenty one is very similar to this. If I have a bad heart, if you've ever had a heart transplant or you had to have something fixed in your chest, you can't do that yourself. You don't just scalpel yourself, hold up a mirror. Oh, I almost got my own heart. Oh, there goes my heart. Okay, where's the other one? Okay, put it on. So, uh, let's see. I can't really see that. Okay, so... <laughs> You can't give yourself even a physical heart transplant. And it's the same thing with spiritual. You can't give yourself a spiritual heart transplant or you, you already would have fixed yourself. You already would have fixed yourself. The fact is you haven't fixed yourself shows that God needs to help. It's all on him to transform your heart. So Jesus' calling card is to save you from your sin. You have a debt against God you can't pay. I can't pay it. You have offended a deity that you cannot pay please. So, because I can't do that, you can't do that, what does God do? We're helpless. God sends Jesus to take our punishment for us so that we can have a right life before God. Isn't that beautiful? So, what, what we will celebrate at Easter is him dying on the cross for our sin, verse 121. But before we get to the cross, we got to have the cradle, right? And so, that's our Christmas in Temecula, the day Jesus stepped into our lives, stepped into this world. Verse 22, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. So Jesus, Jesus' given birth name is Yehoshua, and they called him by his other name, which was Emmanuel. Anytime you see E-L on the end, like Daniel or Emmanuel, the E-L is, is the Hebrew word for God. So in Hebrew... It, it, it would, it's kind of backwards for us because it, it's, it's translated God with us. But, in, but in, in the Hebrew, it's like with us is God. Emmanuel means with us is God, L at the end. So watch, Jesus, watch, right here in this one passage, Jesus gets two names, his given birth name and his title, which is God is our salvation and God has shown up in the flesh. With, God is with us. God is right here with us. Jesus has come in the flesh. God has stepped out of eternity and come into time to come be with us. Two beautiful pieces of, of, of the character of Jesus, which means God with us. Then Joseph awoke from his sleep. He did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and he took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Yehoshua, or Jesus. For many of us, and I've spoken on this before, the relationship we have with our fathers or our father is oftentimes the relationship we have with God. How we see God is oftentimes reflected in how we've seen our dad. And so for some of us that don't know who our dads are or have such sparse relationship with our dad that it almost is non-existent, or we've had very violent or abusive relations with our dad, or maybe we've had a great relationship with our dad, I want you to see this this morning. That the way we interact with our own father is often the way we interact with God. If our fathers are seen as dis, dis, distant, dysfunctional, disjointed, then we see God through that lens oftentimes. So many times, it isn't that people... Many times don't think there's a God because we know there's a God. 
We know, we, we know things come from, from someone. Design comes from someone. Explosions don't create desi- functional design. We know that there's an author of a story, and we sense we are part of the story. And so it's not so often that people, oh, I'm just going to, I don't believe there's a God. It's oftentimes an emotional response to say, if God is like my father, I'm not going to believe in one. And sadly, the connection we often have or don't have with our dads becomes God, God's relationship with us. And so this morning, we're going to take a look at Joseph, who God chose to raise his son But his relationship with his dad, I believe, was the impetus for Joseph being being the obedient man that he is in Matthew chapter 1. That he chose to follow God because I believe of the godliness of his own father. And we're going to walk through that right now. Number one, number one, Joseph loved his father. Joseph loved his father. You know the thing about fatherhood that's really weird is and for myself too, being a father, is that you realize as you become a father how much help you need. (laughs) I mean, there's nothing like being a father. There's nothing like being a father. It's tough for guys to be able to lead their wife if they've never been shown how to lead their wife by their own dad. And you have to learn on the job. You have to learn on the fly how to love your family. You've never were even shown love in your own family, but somehow you gotta like love on your wife and make sure all the kids are okay and still pay the bills, kind of like um, uh, Kurt was talking about this morning for offering. It's like, it's tough to know if you've never been shown that, how to recreate that in a new way in your home, if you never had that kind of home before. See, if you've never led your home before so that your wife can feel like she can trust you and kind of come alongside of you and, and be your helper and, and not be insecure. And, and all the kids can kind of come alongside and see mom and dad working functionally together. Watch, watch how this works. The relationship that everyone has with the father or the dad of the home is oftentimes the exact same relationship that everyone will have with God or how they will view God. Because whether you want to admit it or not, the the husband or the father in the home, everyone looks to him for value. Which is why nobody ever says, I got mommy issues. Everyone always says, I got daddy issues. Right? That comes from somewhere. It doesn't come out of nowhere. It comes from the fact that we expect our dads to be one thing and they might not be that thing. We expect them to be something in our lives that maybe they are or maybe they aren't. But the the whole point is that we have a vacuum in our hearts that says, I need my dad to be this way. If our dads fail to be that way or, or are that way for us, which is awesome, whatever way that is, we view God oftentimes through the lens of our dad. If he turns out to be a failure or dysfunctional, we tend to see God that way. And Joseph this morning, I believe, is going to be a follower of God because he saw his own father following God. He saw Jacob following him, and so he was willing to go through what he's about ready to go through in dealing with Mary because he saw the love that Jacob had for, his, for, for God. When Joseph met Mary, he was probably in his late teens to early 20s, living in his father's house in Nazareth. For Joseph, becoming a responsible man, Able to support a wife meant learning a trade or occupation, probably from his own father, Jacob. Now, here's the thing. If you've got a son in your home, I want you to understand this. 2,000 years ago, you know when you would start working if you were a young man? About the time you could carry something for dad. (laughs) About the time you could carry something for dad, you started working with dad. You started learning a trade. You started learning something. Guess what? In our society, you could be 58 years old living in the basement killing zombies. And as long as mom and dad are okay with it, you can stay that way. For almost all of recorded history, when when a young man was able to work, he got his butt out and worked. Oh. Yeah? (laughs) Preach, Preach on, preacher. For almost all of recorded history, when you, were, when you were old enough to help dad, or when you were old enough to help mom, if you were a young lady in the home, you would start to work. 
And, and now, even in our society, we have extended this experience of adolescence to like as far as it can go. I mean, literally as far as it can go in the history of the world. Now, hey, I remember being 2021 20, when I graduated, you know, when I was still in college, I'm like, dude, I need to stay at home because I don't have a real job. I can't afford nothing, blah, 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 blah. But hey, what? After a while, my parents were like, get the heck out. And you know what? It was good for me because it taught me like, wow, these bills don't get paid on their own. When the electric bill comes, somebody's got to pay that. So weird. I thought the electric company loved me. And they just were going to let me slide. Nope. Joseph went with Jacob probably and learned a trade. He learned his trade, whatever it was. It could have been carpentry. It could have been cutting stones. It could have been farm work or agriculture or whatever it was. He learned some kind of trade from his dad. And I believe that Joseph, as he grew up with Jacob, would have seen Jacob go through all the tough times we all go through when money's super tight when you don't know if you're going to be able to pay the bills, when you don't know if you're going to be able to feed your family. The good times when you got some money or when things, are, things go well, great. But I believe that Joseph looked at Jacob and, and saw all the tough times of life. He saw him trust God. That no matter all the failures that he felt like, that Jacob felt like, Joseph saw Jacob trust God. And that as a young man, for Joseph to see that in his father, goes, you know what? When tough times come my way, I can trust God too. When things don't go well, I can trust God too. Why? Because I've seen it in a person already. I've seen it in Jacob. I've seen it in my dad. So I know that I can do that when I become a dad. While it isn't uh, well known, while it isn't known how well they got along, Joseph developed a deep love for his heavenly father, possibly from his love for his earthly father. And I, and I want to I wanna just state something here, okay? Okay. Um, for, for, for many of us, holidays are tough times because dad's dead or we don't get along with dad or there's a split in the home or whatever. Uh, and I, I want you to realize this. Don't run from the innate need to love your father because that never goes away, okay? Don't, don't put up walls around that and go, I don't really need that. That's not a big deal for me. It is a big deal because it bothers you and it bothers everybody when they really are honest with themselves. It doesn't mean that your relationship with your dad will ever be right because you can only do what you can do. But here's what I want you to see. I don't want you to think in the back of your head, it's not that big of a deal, it's not whatever. No, it's not whatever. It's like the love for your dad is built inside of you. And, and don't, don't, we, we don't want to overstate it, but we won't, don't want to demote it either. We want to put it in its proper place and say, I was built to love my father, but my father's a total tool so I don't really love, I don't feel an emotional love for my dad. But guess what? God can give you a love for your father that you may not even have in your heart right now. Because watch, once you get that thing corrected, you'll be amazed at how well your life finds its proper perspective with God. Because that thing, the hate for dad's not always sitting in the back of your head, boiling back there. If you can get that stuff straightened out, you'll be amazed at how much clearer your relationship with God is. And for some of us during this holiday season, it may take a phone call. Dad, you know how we haven't talked in 28 and a half years? I'm still mad. <laughs> but hey, God's doing some amazing work in my life. I just want to say I love you. And it may be the first time you've ever said you loved your dad in your whole life. And he might not even return. He might go, oh yeah, you are. we done with this conversation. Yo, the uh, Lions game's on. You might go, well, this is a wasted phone call, but it's not wasted. You want to know why? Because as much as it's up to you, be at peace. You won't have peace with everybody, but as much as it's up to you, be at peace. Because then you'll have peace in your own heart. And I believe that Joseph and Jacob had that kind of relationship. Not perfect, just like me and you. We have dysfunctional relationships with our fathers and other adults in our lives. I'm not saying it's perfect. What I'm saying is, even in the imperfection, you can have a perfect relationship with God. And I believe that Joseph had that through his father, Jacob, for this reason right here. Though Mary was probably a young teenager, 
Oh, sorry. Although there is no direct witness to what kind of man Joseph's father was, we do know that it was customary in Jewish culture for the father to find a wife for his son. And that's what we're going to do in our house. I was so excited to see my son sitting in the front row in the first service with my wife. And I said, from the, from the pulpit, I said, you know what's awesome? Is that we're returning back to our, I'm Norwegian, but we're going to return back to our non-Jewish roots and actually perform this, which is customarily the father of the home finds a bride for his son. Praise God. And listen, let me tell you why. And this is all going to, this all fits together. Watch this. As you get older, you start to see the things that really matter for your family. You, th- you see the things that your daughter can't see about that guy. You see the things that your son can't see about that girl. I know she's super hot, son, but inside she's trash. I know he speaks a good game, sweetie, but inside he's garbage. As, as, a, as an adult, you see things that your teenager can't see, right? Everybody with me, old people? Right, right. So watch, watch, how the Jews, watch how the Jews work this out. They go, we're not going to leave dating up to our 15-year-old son because I know who he's choosing. We're going to leave dating up to mom and dad. And guess what? Dad went and found the wife for his son. You want to know why? Because he knew the character that his, wife, uh, that his, his son should have in the home. Because watch this. Even though wives... Don't lead their homes. They can try to step into that role. But even though they don't lead their homes by nature, guess what? Ladies, you set the tone for your home. You are tone, you are home tone setters. And if you, if you think that's not true, think about it this way. When you walk into someone's home, hey, how's it going? Oh, good. If dad's mad, nobody really cares. Right? Like dad could be over there and the lazy boy just watching football going, oh man, I'm so mad, man. Everybody's like, oh, oh, yeah. You know, sit down next to dad. Dad's like, I'm out here. I'm going to have a schlitz and go in the garage or whatever. And he heads out to the garage. Like nobody even cares. Not even, nobody cares. Dad, just go do what you got to do. But man, you walk into a home where mom's mad, that's no joke. Everybody's like, wow, wow. It's amazing how God has given the whole character of the most vital piece of people's lives, which is the home relationships to the, to the, to the mom, to the wife. Listen, I, I've talked about this before. Guys are like boomerangs, right? They just leave their home, go out, do their job, and they come back. And they come back, and they come back. That's men's role. They go out, they make their living, they always come back to the home. The wife is like, she's the base holder together I mean, she, she, she performs that function that without her, life is miserable. So, the point I'm making is a a father will go find the bride for his son and go, that's the woman. Because because we all know, if my son or your son chooses poorly, we know as grandparents, we're going to be paying for it for the rest of our lives. (laughs) Right? Because as some of us get older and our kids start to leave, getting ready to fly the coop, right? Right? We start kind of, we feel that we feel that empty nester feeling as they start getting into high school and college or 58 or wherever they're at and they're still at home. I think it's time to fly, kid. Your wings are getting old. Whenever you start feeling that, you kind of start thinking, gosh, you know what? I wonder what our grandkids are going to be like. And you start thinking like an old grandpa, you know, or grandma, and you go, it's going to be awesome when I give the kids Red Bull and they're all just cracked out and they're having fun in my house. And I go, bye, go home to mom and dad. And mom gets, you know, mom and dad get the train crash of their kids crashing out. But as grandparents, that's our joy, right? (laughs) Play with the kids while they're fun and then go, okay, see ya. See you with mom and dad. Because I know, watch, if you choose poorly, if you choose someone that doesn't love God, you're in for a long road ahead of you. Not that God can't do a miracle. He can. Right now as we sit here, he can change your life and your marriage and your family. But my point is, is that 2,000 years ago, the father would go, wow, that's a young lady after God's heart. That's the kind of man, or that's the kind of woman I want for my son. And they would get married. And, and the, 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 the fathers would put that together. The fathers of the home, of her and him, would put that together. And I believe, watch, and here's the whole point, wrap this up. I believe that Jacob saw in Mary 
something so fantastic that he saw the quality of her and said, that's, that's the young lady I want for my, for my son. And he went and said to her father, what do you think about our kids getting married? Isn't that not the way it should be? <laughs> Praise God. Instead of like, <laughs> see you at Starbucks. That's a great picture of you. I don't, oh, wow, that's awesome. Oh, gosh, I'll just, I'll see you later. I mean, we run our whole, the most intimate parts of our life off our phone and texting. And it's like, what in the world have we done? We're like meeting people in this fake land without ever seeing them in the flesh. You know, it's like they posted a picture from 28 years ago. It's like their high school prom picture or whatever. You're getting ready to date him or her, and you look at that picture, and you go, oh, wow. Jenny, you are fine. I can't, I'm going to meet you at Starbucks right now. And then you meet him, and they're like, are you Jenny's grandma? What happened here? <laughs> oh, yeah, that picture is from forever ago. Oh, yeah, it's from forever ago. All right. It's like the way we date doesn't take the character into account. Now, it's okay to be attracted. That's awesome. But... You know and as well as I do that the attraction comes and goes. There's got to be something beneath the surface, right? And that's what fathers are for. It's to find the character and say, that's the kind I want. That's the kind of woman I want for our family line. And that's what he saw in Mary. Though Mary was probably a young teenager, her devotion to God was so exemplary that Jacob likely recognized this for his own son. If the choosing of Mary was any indication of Jacob's desire for his son to have a godly home and marriage, then Joseph learned the value of loving God from his own father. Oftentimes, the love people have for God is reflective of the relationship they have with their own fathers, and Joseph's love for God may have come from seeing this in his own father's love for God. Number two, Number one was Joseph loved his father, and number two is Joseph loved his son. Joseph loved his son. After the fathers of Joseph and Mary had agreed to the terms of marriage, Joseph and Mary would enter into a betrothal where they were legally married but not cohabitating or sexually active. And I talked about this last week. Um, it's different than an than a, than a, uh, engagement in our society. Uh, if you get engaged to somebody, you give them a ring, usually her, unless he really needs one for whatever reason which is kind of weird, I'm just going to say. So, <laughs> that would be weird. Um, usually, in our society, in our culture, you give uh, the young lady a ring, and it's basically a promise that in six, nine months from now, we'll get married, or whatever it ends up be being, okay? So, but at this time, he and she are in communication. They can move in together. In our society, it's basically free for all. You can do whatever you want. The ring almost has no intrinsic value to the relationship. However, 2,000 years ago, watch what would happen. The father of Mary and the father of Joseph, Jacob, would come together. They would draw up terms of a contract of a marriage. If, if, the, if the children were attracted to one another and liked each other, it would, they didn't have to get married, but they would enter into this time of of betrothal, which is once you sign on the dotted line, you're married. Joseph and Mary are married, but they're not living together. They're not living together and they're not having sex. Watch how amazing this is. A betrothal is you're legally married. The only way you can get out of a betrothal is to have a divorce. Even if you've never even had sex with one another, even if you've never even lived together, it takes a divorce to break a betrothal. It's not like our engagement where basically she just gives you the ring back and goes, I'm out. 2,000 years ago, you had to go through a, a, a divorcing to let the people go their own ways. So watch what happens here. Joseph, probably in his late teens, early 20s. Mary, probably in her early to mid-teens. They get married in a betrothal. She still stays at her father's home, gets ready to become a wife and mother. He still stays at his father's home, starts getting a J-O-B, and starts to be able to save money to either add on to the father's home or start his own home. So that the year later when they actually have their marriage ceremony, they're able to come together 
and he now takes his bride to the new home he's worked on in building. And she's gotten ready to be a wife and mother and collected all the things to be a domestic goddess in their home, okay? This is how the Jewish scenario worked for Joseph and Mary. When Joseph finds out that Mary, his teenage bride, is pregnant, he doesn't think in the back of his mind, must be the Holy Spirit. (laughs) Here's the deal. She gets pregnant. She goes, Joseph, I'm pregnant. He goes, what? You know what I love about Joseph? He's a real guy. You know what he says in the back of his mind? I'm out. Mary, if you're going to sleep around on me, this is it. It's the last time we ever even lock eyes. You know what Joseph does? He goes home. I love this story. He goes home. He's getting ready to go to sleep. Fluffing up his pillow, going, when I wake up tomorrow, man, I'm going to cut her loose. She's going to sleep around on me and get pregnant. This is it. It's the last time. As he's closing his eyes, all of a sudden, boom, into his life comes an angel. And into that dream that he's having, the angel tells him, She's pregnant, and she's still a virgin. Now imagine for Joseph the mind meld that just happens here. He realizes in his dream that Mary told the truth. She's still a virgin, but she's pregnant. The only time that excuse ever worked in history, (laughs) because an angel showed up. But I want you to realize something. If the angel doesn't show up, Joseph's like, see ya. We get a divorce, which is why they had to get a divorce, because they were legally married, but not living together. Not having sex, they're both virgins, uh, but they're getting ready to have their marriage ceremony. But they needed a divorce. He's ready to divorce her, the angel shows up. This is a pivotal moment for Joseph, because guess what? Guys, place yourself in Joseph's shoes for a second. You know that when you wake up the next day, no one's going to believe you or Mary that she's actually pregnant and still a virgin. So they're going to assume that you couldn't even control yourself and you made up some story. So actually, the shame that Mary has in being a promiscuous woman, quote unquote, is the same shame you're going to have to share because it's going to look like you guys couldn't wait till your wedding day. That you lacked so much self-control that you couldn't even wait six months or nine months or a year. And so he he has a choice to make like Mary did last week, and said, you know what? I will do whatever it takes to serve God, even if it means I have to look bad. I demote myself to exalt God. And that's a man of God. Wow, that's a stud. That is a stud. Because most guys would go, I don't even care if an angel showed up. You're out. You wake up the next day and go, man, I had some bad pizza, or whatever. He'd be Italian, but... I had a bad falafel. Better? (laughs) I ate some bad food, had a bad dream. That wasn't even real. But he wakes up knowing it was God calling him to this. And he sticks with it as a man of God. Once Joseph found out Mary was unfaithful, and before he heard from the angel, he not only didn't bring her out to be stoned to death for adultery but wanted to divorce her quietly, not to bring her shame. Even in disappointment and hurt, everything he did was influenced by his desire to love God and love others. And I love this about Joseph. I believe what he learned from his own father, Jacob, he applied to this situation. That even when you're hurt, even when you're disappointed, you don't give up. You don't say, because my feelings are hurt, I'm going to burn the whole village down. Because one person hurt me, I'm going to nuke the whole world. Because many of us are like that. Many of us are hotheads, right? The minute something goes wrong, oh man, who's got to die now? <laughs> you calm down. Somebody just cut, cut line in Target or whatever. Dude, wow. Relax. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, you're right. Somebody cut in front of me in Target. It's not that big a deal. Okay, <sighs> take a breath, man. Wow, what's going on? You see where people's heart is at when stress hits, right? Anybody can act great when things are going well. When stress hits, when the grind of stress hits you, it actually squeezes out your character. 
Stress is built by God to be in your life to show what you really are on the inside. Remember those, those little uh, toys you would have for your kids where inside the little hollow thing, you'd press some Play-Doh and then you'd, you'd press like the, the little form down on the Play-Doh and out through the Play-Doh, you know, the, it'd be a square or a star or something. You see it come squishing up. That's exactly what stress does to all of our lives. You see who you are, not by how you are when things are great. You see who you are when everything train wrecks and you've got to put your life back together because then it shows who you really trust. If you trust yourself, you get angry, you get crazy, you start going nuts. Why? Because you've got to get control. When you trust God, you go, wow, I'm really hurt. This is really lame. I really hate this, but God, I trust you. And I believe you have a plan for me, even inside of this disaster. That's exactly what Joseph had to do. He had to say, this is a total disaster, but I trust you, God. And for years, he had to put up with people going, oh, I remember you. You were that one guy. Got Mary pregnant and said it was God. <laughs> oh, how convenient that God showed up. I mean, the mocking Joseph must have gone through must have been horrendous, especially for a culture of shame, where if you're pregnant, in that kind of culture, it's different than ours. You'll live with that for the rest of your life. Once the angel revealed she was a virgin and pregnant, he took the public shame on himself as everyone would assume it was his. Amazingly, he didn't have intercourse with his wife for at least nine months, showing tremendous self-discipline to honor God's word. Wow, maybe that's the real reason Joseph was chosen. You ready? Buckle up for this one. You know what the scripture just says in Matthew 1? It says that she's already pregnant from the Holy Spirit. She's already pregnant and she's his wife. So you would think pregnancy, game on. Married, game on. Everything says game on to this point. You know what Joseph says? He says to himself, in order that there's not going to be any confusion about whose child this is, I'm going to honor God by not having sex with my own wife who's pregnant until she gives birth to Jesus. It says right there in Scripture, he knew her not until she had given birth to Jesus. Is that not a stud? Dude, Joseph is a stud all the way around. I just, if Joseph was here right now, I'd go, high five to you, Joseph. <laughs> I love the organic story of this. It's real people like you and me dealing with a real, this isn't plasticky Christmas story. This is like a real person struggling with the reality of what God asked him to do. And you know what? He came through in flying colors. He shows tremendous self-discipline to just say, you know what? We're, we can have sex for the rest of our lives, but I'm going to honor God with this moment of your pregnancy of Christ. And I love that about Joseph. He did whatever it took to honor God, including showing self-discipline in an area that he might not even have had to show self-discipline in because they're already married, and she's already pregnant. That's a stud. That is a godly stud. I love that about Joseph. Though Joseph disappears from the biblical record after Jesus is 12 years old, from Jesus' birth through Jesus' early adolescent years, Joseph led his family in love and godliness. Joseph went to Bethlehem. He obediently named Jesus he presented Jesus at the temple as part of the, the religious rites. He led his family to worship God and protected them when people wanted to kill his son. Joseph's life of obedience and love for God set the foundation for Jesus to love and obey his heavenly father. So I'm going to wrap this whole thing up with this. Ready? I believe Jacob, which we saw at the beginning of this passage that we read today, showed the kind of love for God through disappointment and, and issues in his life, that when Joseph hit those, he saw it in his own father's life, and he saw God correctly. Joseph, when Jacob now dies, Joseph is here, and even though Joseph disappears from Jesus' life, probably by when he was about 12 or 13, it's possible that, that Joseph died, but as, as he raised Jesus for those years, Jesus saw in Joseph a love for God. And I believe that even though Jesus was God come in the flesh and he would have had a correct relationship with his heavenly father anyway, being God in the flesh, I believe that physically 
God chose Joseph because he knew that Joseph would be the right example for Jesus, for his own son, in his response to his heavenly father. Think about that, guys. Think about if God said to you, I want you to raise me. <laughs> what? Yeah, I'm coming to earth and I choose you. We, we, are you going to raise me? I mean, imagine this, the chaos there. You think your teenager is always right. I mean, imagine raising Jesus. You know, a teenager, always, he, he or she knows everything in the history of the world, right? His, you as a parent are the stupidest person that's ever lived in the history of the world. And imagine, and for the most part, your teenager is like 99.7% wrong the majority of the time, right? I mean, 0.3, they're right. But imagine raising Jesus. Jesus is always right. Jesus, I think that, I don't, I don't think you're right about that. Let me check on that. Jesus was like, oh, trust me, I'm right. You know, back in the day, Joseph would have like Googled that. I'll just say if that's right. <laughs> oh, you're right again, Jesus. Like, no, wow, that's, you're, you're right. I should have taken you on in that trivia game that we were playing. <laughs> but you know what I love about Joseph? Is that he took on the challenge of raising Jesus, God come in the flesh. And the reason I believe God chose Joseph was because Jacob, his father, showed him what it meant to follow God. Because Jacob found a, a godly wife for Joseph. And we saw last week Mary's beautiful response to the angel saying, hey, I'm, I'm going to ask you to carry the Son of God and change everyone's lives. And Mary took all that shame upon herself, and now Joseph chooses the same thing because he was that kind of man. And for all of us men in here, let us be encouraged that God is not done with us. Whether we had a good example or a bad example or a non-existent example, guess what? God specializes in changing the future. You don't live in your past. You live now and forward. God says, I know you didn't know how to, how to do this because nobody showed you. But me, I, rec I identify myself as, as God a father. And I will show you as a father how to love your family. I know you didn't have an example. That's okay. But as we move forward together, men, we can be the men that God has called us to be. We're not going to be perfect. We're not going to be super amazing. But God can do amazing things with us. God can teach us and train us to be the men of God that he's called us to be, even if nobody else did.